Act five. Scene one, Pinchwife's house. Enter Pinchwife and Mrs. Pinchwife, a table and a candle. Come, take the pen and make an end of the letter just as you intended. If you are false in a tittle, I shall soon perceive it and punish you as you deserve. He lays his hand on his sword. Write what was to follow. Let's see. You must make haste and help me away before tomorrow, or else I shall be forever out of your reach, for I can defer no longer our... What follows our? Must all out then, bud. Look you here then. Mrs Pinchwife takes the pen and writes. Let's see. For I can no longer defer our... Wedding. Your slighted Olivia. What's the meaning of this? My sister's named it. Speak, unriddle. Yes, indeed, bud. But why her name to it? Speak, speak, I say. Aye, but you'll tell her then again, if, if you would not tell her again. I, I will not. I'm stunned. My head turns around. Speak. Won't you tell her indeed and indeed? No. Speak, I say. She'll be angry with me, but I had rather she should be angry with me than you, bud. And to tell you the truth, t'was she made me write the letter and taught me that I should write. Oh. Huh. I thought the style was somewhat better than her own. <laughs> Could she come to you to teach you, since I had locked you up alone? Oh. Through the keyhole, bud. But why should she make you write a letter for her to him, since she can write herself? Because lest Mr. Horner should be so cruel and refuse her, or be vain afterwards and show the letter, she might disown it. The hand is not being hers. How's this? Hmm. Then I think I shall come to myself again. This changeling could not invent this lie. But if she could, why should she? She might think I should soon discover it. Stay. Now I think on it too. Horner said he was sorry she had married Sparkish, and her disowning her marriage to me makes me think she has evaded it for Horner's sake. Yet why should she take this course? But men and love are fools. Women may well be so. But hark you, madam, your sister went out in the morning, and I have not seen her within since. Alack a day, she has been crying all day above, it seems, in a corner. Where is she? Let me speak with her. Oh, Lord, then she'll discover it all. Pray hold, bud. What do you mean to discover me? She'll know I have told you then. Pray, bud, let me talk to her first. I must speak with her, to know whether Horner ever made her any best, whether she be married to Sparkish or no. Pray, dear bud, don't till I've spoken with her and told her that I have told you, for she'll kill me else. Go then, and bid her come out to me. Yes, yes, bud. Let me see. I'll go, but she is not within to come to him. I have just got time to know Lucy, her maid, who first set me on work. What lie shall I tell him tell next? Am I even at my wit's end? Mrs. Pinchwife exits. Well, I resolve it. Horner shall have her. I'd rather give him my sister than lend her by my wife. And such an alliance will prevent his pretensions to my wife, sure. I'll make him of kin to her, and then he won't care for her. Re-enter Mrs. Pinchwife. Oh, Lord Bud, I told you what anger you would make me with my sister. Won't she come hither? No, no. Lack a day, she's ashamed to look at look you in the face. And she says, if you go into her, she'll run 
down the stairs and shamefully go by herself to Mr. Horner, who has promised her marriage, she says, and she will have no other, so she won't. Did he so? Promise her marriage? Then she shall have no other. Go tell her so. And if she will come and discourse with me a little concerning the means, I will write about it immediately. Go. Exit Mrs. Pinchworth. His estate is equal to Sparkish's, and his extraction is much better than his, as his parts are. But my chief reason is, I'd rather be akin to him by the name of brother-in-law than that of Cuckold. Re-enter, Mrs. Pinchwife. Well, what said she now? Why, she says she would, she would only have you lead her to Horner's lodging, to whom she first will discourse the matter before she talks with you, which yet she cannot do for a lack of poor creature. She says she can't so much as look at you in the face, for she'll come, at, but for, therefore she'll come to you in a mask. And you must excuse her, for she make you no answer to any question of yours till you have brought her to Mr. Horner. And if you will not chide her nor question her, she'll come out to you immediately. Let her come. I will not speak a word to her nor require a word from her. Oh, I forgot. Besides, she says she cannot look you in the face, though through a mask, therefore would desire you to put out the candle. I agree to all. Let her make haste. There, it is out. Pinchwife puts out the candle. Exit Mrs. Pinchwife. My case is something better. I'd rather fight with Horner for not lying with my sister than for lying with my wife. And of the two, I'd rather find my sister too forward than my wife. I expected no other from her free education, as she calls it, and her passion for the town. Well, wife and sister are names which make us expect love and duty, pleasure and comfort, but we find them plagues and torments, and are equally, though differently, troublesome to their keeper. For we have as much ado to get people to lie with our sisters as to keep them from lying with our wives. Re-enter Mrs. Pinchwife, masked, and in hoods and scarfs, and a nightgown and petticoat of Alithius. What? Are you come, sister? Let us go, then. But first, let me lock up my wife. Miss Marjorie, where are you? Here, bud. Come hither, so that I may lock you up. Get you in. Pinchwife locks the door. Come, sister, where are you now? Mrs. Pinchwife gives him her hand, but when he lets her go, she steals softly onto the other side of him and is led away by him for his sister. Scene two, Horner's lodging. Horner and Quack. What? All alone? Not so much as one of your cuckolds here, nor one of their wives. They used to take their turns with you as if they were to watch you. Oh, yes, it often happens that a cuckold is but his wife's spy and is more upon family duty when he is with her gallant abroad, hindering his pleasure than when he is at home with her playing the gallant. gallant. But the hardest duty a married woman imposes upon a lover is keeping her husband company always. And his fondness with you almost as soon as hers. Ah, pox. Keeping a cuckold company after... You've had his wife is as tiresome as the company of a country squire to a witty fellow of the town when he's got all his money. And as at first a man makes a friend of the husband to get the wife, so at last you are fain to fall out with the wife to be rid of the husband. Aye, most cuckold makers are true courtiers. When once a poor man has cracked his credit for him, they can't abide to come near him. But at first, to draw him in, are so sweet, so kind, so dear, just as you are to pinch, wife. But what becomes of that intrigue with his wife? A pox. He's as surely as an alderman that has been bit. And since uh, he's so coy, his wife's kindness is in vain, for she's a silly innocent. Did she not send you a letter by him? 
Yes, but that's the riddle of not yet solved. Allow the poor creature to be willing, she is silly too, and he keeps her up so close. Yes, so close that he makes her but the more willing and adds but revenge to her love, which two, when met, seldom fail of satisfying each other one way or other. What is the man we're talking of, I think? Enter Pinchwife, leading in his wife masked, muffled, and in her sister's gown. Sure. Bringing his wife to you is the next thing to bringing a love letter from her. What means this? The last time, you know, sir, I bought you a love letter. Now you see a mistress. I think you'll say I am a civil man to you. <laughs> Ay, the devil take me. Or will I so that say thou art the civilest man I've ever met with? And I've known some. But I fancy I understand thee now better than I did the letter. But hark thee in thy ear. What? Nothing but the usual question, man. Is she sound on thy word? What? You take her for a wench and me for a pimp? <laughs> oh, for sure. Wench and pimp are words. I... I know thou art an honest fellow, and uh, hast uh, a great acquaintance among the ladies, and perhaps hast made love for me rather than let me make love to thy wife. Come, sir. In short, I am for no fooling. Nor I neither. Therefore, privy, let's see her face presently. Make her show, man. Art thou sure I don't know her? I am sure you do know her. Ah, oh, Pox, why dost thou bring her to me, then? Because she's a relation of mine. Is she? Faith, man. Uh, then thou art still more civil and obliging, dear rogue. Who desired me to bring her to you? Then she is very obliging, dear rogue. You'll make her welcome for my sake, I hope. I hope she is handsome enough to make herself welcome. Privy, let her unmask. Do you speak to her? She would never be ruled by me. Madam? Mrs. Pinchwife whispers to Horner. She says she must speak with me in private. Uh, withdraw, Privy. She is unwilling, it seems. I should know all her decent, uh, co indecent conduct in this business. Well then, I'll leave you two together and hope when I'm gone you'll agree. If not, you and I shan't agree, sir. What means the fool? If she and I agree, tis no matter what you and I do. Whispers to Mrs. Pinchwife, who makes signs with her hand for him to be gone. In the meantime, I'll fetch a parson and find out Sparkish and disabuse him. You would have me fetch a parson, would you not? Well then, now I think I'm rid of her and shall have no more trouble with her. Our sisters and daughters, like usurers' money, are safest when put out. But our wives, like their writings, never safe but in our closets under lock and key. Pinchwife exits. Enter boy. Sir Jasper Fidget, sir, is coming up. He exits. Here's the trouble of a cuckold now we're talking of. A pox on him. Has he not enough to do to hinder his wife's sport, but he must other women's too? Uh, step in here, madam. Exit Mrs. Pinchwife. Enter Sir Jasper Fidget. My best and dearest friend. The old style, Doctor. Well, be short, for I am busy. What would you, your impertinent wife, have now? Well, guest in faith, for I do come from her. To invite me to supper? Tell her. I, I can't come. Go. Nay, nay, now you are out, faith. For my lady and the whole knot of the virtuous gang, as they call themselves, are resolved upon a frolic of coming to you tonight in masquerade, and all are dressed already. I shan't be home. Lord, how churlish she is to women. Nay, Privy, don't disappoint them. They'll think it is my fault. Privy, don't. I'll send in the banquet and the fiddles. But make no noise on it, for the poor virtuous rogues would not have it known for the world that they go a masquerading, and they would come to no man's ball but yours. Well, well, get you gone and tell them if they come. T'will be at their peril of their honour and yours. We'll trust you for that. Farewell. Sir Jasper exits. Doctor, and on. You two shall be my guests, but now I'm going to a private feast. Exit hall. Scene three. The Piazza of Covent Garden.
Enter Sparkish with a letter in his hand and Pinchwife following. But who would have thought a woman could have been false to me? By the world, I could not have thought it. You were forgiven and taken liberty. She has taken it only, sir, now you find in that letter. You are a frank person and so is she. You see there. Nay, if this be her hand, for I never saw it. It's no matter, what matter whether that be her hand or no. I am sure this hand, at her desire, led her to Mr. Horner, with whom I left her just now, to go fetch a parson to him at their desire too, to deprive you of her forever. For it seems yours was but a mock marriage. Indeed, she would needs have it that it was Harcourt himself in a parson's habit that married us, but I'm sure he told me twas his brother Ned. Ah, oh, there it is out, and you were deceived, not she, for you are such a frank person. But I must be gone. You'll find her at Mr. Horner's. Go, and believe your eyes. Pinchwife exits. Nay, I'll to her, and call her as many crocodiles, sirens, harpies, and other heathenish names, as a poet would do a mistress who had refused to hear his soup. Nay, more, his ass is on her. Stay, is not the chief following a torch at the other end of the piazza? And from Horner's certainly, tis so. Enter Alithia following a torch, and Lucy behind. You are well met, madam, though you don't think so. What, you have made a short visit to Mr. Horner? But I suppose you'll return to him presently, by that time the parson can be with him. Mr. Horner and the parson, sir? Come, madam, no more disassembling, no more jilting, for I am no more a frank person. How's this? Oh, it will work, I see. Could you find out no easy country fool to abuse? None but me, a gentleman of wit and pleasure about the town. But it was your pride to be hard for a man of parts. Unworthy, false woman. False as a friend that lends a man money to lose. False as dice who undo that trust or they have to abuse. He has been a great bubble by his similes, as they say. You have been too merry, sir, at your wedding, wedding dinner, sure. What? Do you mock me so? Or you have been deluded. By you? Let me understand you. Have you the confidence, I should call it something else since you know your guilt, to stand my just reproaches? You did not write an impudent letter to Mr. Horner, who I find now has clubbed with you in deluding me with his aversion for women, that I might not forsooth suspect him for my rival. Do you think the gentleman can be jealous now, madam? I write a letter to Mr. Horner? Nay, hey, madam, do not deny it. Your brother showed it me just now, and told me likewise. He left you at home. Honor's lodging to fetch the pass and marry you to him. I wish you joy, madam. Joy! Joy! And to him too much joy, and myself more joy for not marrying you. So I find my brother would break off the match, and I can consent to it, since I see this gentleman can be made jealous. Oh, Lucy, by his rude usage and jealousy, he makes me almost afraid I am married to him. Art thou sure it was Harcourt himself and no parson that married us? No, madam, I thank you. I suppose that was a contrivance too of Mr. Horner and yours to make Harcourt play the parson. But I would as little as you have him, one now, no, not for the world. Or shall I tell you another truth? I never had any passion for you till now. For now, I hate you. It is true. I might have married your portion, as other men of parts from the town do sometimes, and so your servant, and show my unconcernedness, I'll come to your wedding and resign you with as much joy as I would a stale wench to a new Callie. 
Nay, with as much joy as I would after the first night, if I had been married to you. There's for you, and so your servant, servant. Sparkish exits. How was I deceived in a man? You will believe that a fool may be made jealous now, for that easiness in him that suffers him to be led by a wife will likewise permit him to be persuaded against her by others. But marry Mr. Horner? My brother does not intend it, sure. If I thought he did, I would take thy advice and Mr. Harcourt for my husband. And now I wish that if there be any over-wise over woman of the town who, like me, would marry a fool for fortune, liberty, or title first, and her husband may love play and be a cully to all the town but her and suffer none but fortune to be mistress of his purse. Then, if for liberty, that he may send her into the country under the conduct of some housewifely mother-in-law. And if for title, may the world give him none but that of cuckold. And for her greater curse, madam, may he not deserve it. Away, impertinence. Not this, my old lady Luntaloos? Yes, madam. And here I hope we, will, we shall find Miss, Mr. Harcourt. Exit all. Scene four, Horner's lodging. A table, banquet, and bottles. Enter Horner, Lady Fidget, Mrs. Dainty Fidget, and Mrs. Squeamish. A pox, they are coming too soon. Before I've sent back my new mistress. All that I have now to do is to lock her in, uh, that they may not see her. That we may be sure of our welcome, we have brought our entertainment with us, and are resolved to treat thee, dear Toad. And that we may be merry to purpose, have left Sir Jasper and my old lady squeamish quarrelling at home at backgammon. Therefore, let us make use of our time, lest they should charge to interrupt us. Let us sit then. <laughs> First, that you may be private, uh, let me lock this door and that, and I'll wait upon you presently. No, sir, shut him only, and your lips forever, for we must trust you as much as our women. You know all vanities killed in me. I have no occasion for talking. Now, ladies, supposing we had drank each of us our two bottles, let us speak the truth of our hearts. Agreed. Agreed. By this brimmer, for truth is nowhere else to be found, not in thy heart, false man. You have found me a true man, I'm sure. Not in every way, but let us sit and be merry. Why should our damn tyrants of flatters... Not even going to try. <laughs> On the pittance of pleasure which they only give, we must not rejoice with wine and with noise. In vain we must wake in a dull bed alone, whilst to our warm rival the bottle they're gone. Then lay aside charms and take up these arms, tis wine only gives them courage and wit. Because we live sober, to men we submit. If for beauties you'd pass, take a lick of the glass. Twill mend your complexions, and when they are gone, the best red we have is the red of the grape. Then, sisters, lay it on, and damn a good shape. Dear Brimmer, well, in token of our openness and plain dealing, let us throw our masks over our heads. So, twill come to the glasses and on. Lovely Brimmer, let me enjoy him first. No, I never part with a gallant till I've tried him. Dear Brimmer, that makest our husbands short-sighted. And our bashful gallants bold. And for want of a gallant, the but lovely in our eyes. A drink, eunuch. Drink, thou representative of a husband. Damn a husband. And, as it were a husband, an old keeper. And an old grandmother. Yeah, and an English board and a French surgeon. Aye, we have all reason to curse them. For my sake, ladies? No, for our own. For the first spoils of all young gallants' industry. 
And the others are to make some bold only with common women. And rather run the hazard of the vile distemper amongst them than of a denial amongst us. The filthy toads choose mistresses now as they do stuffs for having been fancied and worn by others. For being common and cheap. Whilst women of quality, like the richest stuffs, lie untumbled and unasked for. Aye, neat and cheap and new, often they think best. No, sir. The beasts will be known by a mistress longer than by a suit. And tis not for cheapness, neither. No, for the vain fops will take up druggets and embroider them. But I wonder at the depraved appetites of witty men. They used to be out of the common road and hate imitation. Pray tell me, beast, when you were a man, why you rather choose to club with a multitude in a common house for an entertainment than to be the only guest at a good table? Uh, why faith, ceremony and expectation are un unsufferable to those that are sharp bent. People always eat with the best stomach at an ordinary where every man is snatching for the best bit. Though he never get a cut over the fingers. But I have heard that people eat most, that people eat most heartily of another man's meat. That is what they do not pay for. Oh, when they are sure of their welcome and freedom, for ceremony in love and eating is as ridiculous as in fighting. For, falling on briskly is all should be done on those occasions. Well then, let me tell you, sir, there is nowhere more freedom than in our houses, and we take freedom from a young person as a sign of good breeding, and a person may be as free as he pleases with us, as frolic as gamesome, as wild as he will. <laughs> Aren't I heard you all declaim against wild men? Yes, but for all that, we think wildness in a man is as desirable a quality as in a duck or a rabbit. A tame man? Oh. I know not, uh, but your reputations frighten me as much as your face has invited me. A reputation? Lord, why should you not think that we women make use of our reputation, as you men of yours, only to deceive the world with less suspicion? Our virtue is like the statesman's religion, the Quaker's word, the gamester's oath, and the great man's honour, but to cheat those that trust us. And that demureness coyness and modesty that you see in our faces in the boxes at plays is as much a sign of a kind woman as a vizard mask in the pit. For oh, I assure you, women are least masked when they have the velvet vizard on. You would have found us modest women in our denials only. Our bashfulness is only the reflection of the men's. We blush when we are shamefaced. I beg your pardon, ladies. I was deceived in your and uh, deceived in you devilishly. But uh, why that mighty pretense to honour? We've told you, but sometimes twas for the same reason you men pretend business often to avoid ill company, to enjoy the better and more privately those you love. But why would you ne'er give a friend a wink then? Faith, your reputation frightened us. As much as ours did you. You were so notoriously lewd. And you so seemingly honest. Was that all that deterred you? And so expensive. You allow freedom, you say. Hi, hi. Oh, that I was afraid of losing my little money, uh, as well as my little time, both which my other pleasures required. Money? <laughs> you talk like a little fellow now. Do such as we expect money? I beg your pardon, madam. I, I must confess, I have heard that great ladies, like great merchants, set but the higher prices upon what they have, uh, because they are not in necessity of taking the first offer. Such as we make sale of our hearts, we bribe for our love, so. With your pardon, ladies, I know, uh, like great men in offices, you seem to exact 
flattery and attendance only from your followers, but you have receivers about you and such fees to pay. A man is afraid to pass your grants. Besides, we must let you win at cards or we lose your hearts. And if you make an assignation, it is at a goldsmith's jeweler's or china house, where for your honour you deposit to him. He must pawn his to the punctual sit, and so paying for what you take up, pays for what he takes up. Would you not have us assured of our gallant's love? For love is better known by liberality than by jealousy. For one may be dissembled, but the other not. But my jealousy can no longer be dissembled, and they are telling ripe. Come, here's to our gallants in waiting, whom we must name, and I'll begin. This is my false rogue. Claps him on the back. How? So, all will out now. Did you not tell me? Well, t'was for my sake only you reported yourself no man. Oh, wretch! Did you not swear to me? T'was for my love and honour you passed for that thing you do. <laughs> so, so. Come, speak, ladies. This is my false villain. And mine, too. And mine. Uh, well, then, uh, you are all free, my false rogues, too, and uh, there's an end on it. Well, then, there's no remedy. Sister sharers, let us not fall out, but have a care of our honour. Though we get no presents, no jewels of him, we are savers of our honour, the jewel of most value and use, which shines yet to the world unsuspected. So it be counterfeit. Uh, nay, and his ain't as good as if it were true, provided the world thinks so, for honour, like beauty now, only depends on the opinion of others. Well, Harry Common, I hope you can be true to thee, swear, but tis no purpose to require your oath, for you as often forsworn as you swear to new women. Come, faith, madam, let us aim upon one another, for all the difference I find betwixt we men and you women, we forswear ourselves at the beginning of an amour, you as long as it lasts. Enter Sir Jasper Fidget and old lady Squeamish. Oh, my lady Fidget, was this your cunning to come to Mr Horner without me? But you have been nowhere else, I hope. No, Sir Jasper. And you come straight hither, Biddy? Yes, indeed, Lady Grandmother. Tis well, tis well. I knew when once they were thoroughly acquainted with poor Horner, they'd ne'er be from him. <laughs> you may let her masquerade it with my wife and Horner, and I warrant her reputation safe. Enter boy. Oh, sir, is the gentleman come whom you bid me not suffer to come up with, without giving you notice with a lady too and other gentlemen? Do you all go in there whilst I send them away? And boy, uh, do you desire him to stay below till I come, uh, which shall be immediately. Exit Sir Jasper Fidget, Lady Fidget, Lady Squeamish, Mrs Squeamish, and Mrs Dainty Fidget. Yes, sir! Boy exits. Exit Horner at the other door, and returns with Mrs Pinchwife. You would not take my advice to be gone home before your husband came back. He'll now discover all, yet... Pray, my dearest, uh, be persuaded to go home and leave the rest of my management. Um, I'll let you down the back way. I don't know the way home, so I don't. And my man shall wait upon you. No, you don't be believe that I'll go at all. What, are you weary of me already? Oh, no, my life. It is that I may love you long. It is to secure my love and your reputation with your husband. He'll never receive you again else. What care I? Do you think to frighten me with that? I don't intend to go to him again. You shall be my husband now. I cannot be your husband, dear, since uh, you're married to him. Oh, would you make me believe that? Don't I see every day in London here, women leave their husbands and go and live with other men as their wives? Pish, sure. You'd make me angry, but I love you so mainly. So they are coming up. Uh, in, a, in again, in, I, I hear them. Exit Mrs Pitchwife. 
oh, well, a silly mistress is like a weak place. Soon got, soon lost. Um, and a sc scarce time for plunder. She betrays her husband, first to her gallant, and then her gallant to her husband. And her pinch wife, Alithia, Harcourt, Sparkish, Lucy, and a parson. Sorry, guys, sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> Come, madam, it is not the sudden change of your dress, the confidence of your asseverations, and your false witness there shall persuade me I did not bring you hither just now. Here's my witness. You cannot deny it, since you must be confronted. Mr. Horner, did I not bring this lady to you just now? Uh, now must I wrong one woman for another's sake. Uh, but that's no new thing uh, with me, for in these cases, I am still on the criminal side against the innocent. Pray speak, sir. It must be so. It must be impudence. Uh, and try my luck. Impudence uses to be too hard for truth. What? You are studying an evasion or excuse for her? Speak, sir. No, Faith. I am something backward only to speak in women's affairs or disputes. She bids you speak. I pray, sir, do pray satisfy him. Uh, then truly you did bring that lady to me just now. Oh. Ho. How, sir? How, Honour? What mean you, sir? I always took you for a man of honour. I so much a man of honour that I must save my mistress. Uh, I thank you, uh, come what will on. So, if I had had her, she'd have made me believe the moon had been made of a Christmas pie. Now could I speak, if I durst, and solve the riddle who am the author of it. Oh, unfortunate woman! A combination against my honour, which most concerns me now, because you share in my disgrace, sir. And it is your censure which I must now suffer that troubles me, not theirs. Madam, have no trouble. You shall see now it is possible for me to love too without being jealous. I will not only believe your innocence myself, but make all the world believe it. Honour, I must now be concerned for this lady's honour. And I must be concerned for a lady's honours too. This lady has her honour, and I will protect it. Oh, my lady has not her honour, but has given it me to keep, and I will preserve it. Uh, I understand you not. Uh, I would not have you. What's the matter with them all? Come, come, Mr. Horner, no more disputing. Here's the parson. I brought him not in vain. Uh, no, sir, I'll employ him, if this lady please. How? What do you mean? I. what does he mean? Why, why, have I resigned your sister to him? He has, he has my consent. But he is not mine, sir. A woman's injured honour, no more than a man's, can be repaired or satisfied by any but him that first wronged it. And you shall marry her presently, or... Lace his hand on his sword. Re-enter Mrs. Pinchwife. Oh, Lord, they'll kill poor Horner. Besides, he shan't marry her whilst I stand by and look on. I'll not lose my second husband so. What do I see? My sister in my clothes. <laughs> Nay, pray, now don't quarrel about finding work for the person. He shall marry me to Mr. Parson. He shall marry me to Mr. Horner. Or now, I believe you, you have, you have enough of me. Damn Damn loving changeling. Pray, sister, pardon me for telling so many lies of you. I suppose the riddle is plain now. No, that must be my work. Good sir, hear me. Lucy kneels to Pinchwife, who stands doggedly with his hat over his eyes. I will never hear women again, but make them all silent thus. Offers to draw his sword upon his wife. Uh, no, no, that must not be. You then shall go first. It is all one to me. Starts to draw his sword on Horner, but is stopped by Harcourt. Hold! Re-enter Sir Jasper at Fidget, Lady Fidget, Lady Squeamish, Mrs. Dainty Fidget, and Mrs. Squeamish. What is the matter? What's the matter? Pray, what is the matter, sir? I beseech you, communicate, sir! Why, my wife has communicated, sir, as your wife may have done too, sir, if she knows him, sir. <laughs> 
Do you mock me, sir? A cuckold is a kind of a wild beast. Have a care, sir. Oh, sure, you mock me, sir. He cuckold you. It can't be. <laughs> what? I'll tell you, sir. Leans in to whisper to Pinchwife. I tell you again. He has whored my wife and yours too, if he knows her. And all uh, the way. And, uh, and, all, and all the way. It's not his dissembling. It's dissembling. He can read on me. read on me. How? How? Does he? Does he? Dissemble? Is he a hypocrite? <laughs> Nay, then. How? My sister, is he a hypocrite? A hypocrite? A dissembler? Speak, young harlotry, speak! How? Nay, then. Oh, my head too. Oh, thou libidinous lady. Oh, thou harloting harlotry. Hast thou done it then? Speak, good horner, art thou a dissembler, a rogue? Hast thou? So! I'll fetch you off, and her too, if she will but hold her tongue. Canst thou, I'll give thee... Pray, have but patience to hear me, sir, who am the unfortunate cause of all this confusion. Your wife is innocent, I only culpable, for I put her upon telling you all these lies concerning my mistress in order to, in order to the breaking of the match between Mr. Sparkish and her to make way for Mr. Harcourt. Did you, sir, eternal rotten tooth? Then it seems my mistress was not false to me. I was only deceived by you. Brother, that should have been now man of conduct, who is a frank person now to bring your wife to her lover. I assure you, sir, she came not to Mr. Horner out of love, for she loves him no more. Hold, I shall t I told lies for you, but you shall tell none for me. For I do love Mr. Horner with all my soul, and nobody shall say me nay. Pray, don't go make poor Mr. Horner believe to the contrary. Tis spitefully done of you, I'm sure. Peace, dear idiot. Nay, I will not peace. Enter Dorland and Quack. Horner, your servant. I am the doctor's guest. He must excuse our intrusion. What's the matter, gentlemen? For heaven's sake, what's the matter? Oh, tis well you are come. Uh, tis a censorous world we live in. You may have brought me a reprieve, or else I'd have died for a crime I never committed. And these innocent ladies had suffered with me. Therefore, pray, satisfy these worthy, honourable, jealous gentlemen that... Uh -huh. Oh, I understand you. Is that all? Uh, Sir Jasper, by heavens, and upon the word of a physician, sir. Oh, nay, I do believe you truly. Pardon me, my virtuous lady and dear of honour. What? Then all's right again? Aye, aye, and now let us satisfy him too. They whisper with Pinchwife. Munich, pray no fooling with me. I'll bring half the churchans in town to swear it. Faith, they will swear a man that bled to death through his wounds died of an apoplexy. Pray hear me, sir. Why, all the town has heard the report of him. But does all the town believe it? Pray inquire a little, and first of all these. I'm sure when I left the town he was the lewdest fellow in it. I tell you, sir, he has been in France since. Pray ask but these ladies and gentlemen, your friend, Mr. Dorland. Gentlemen and ladies, hadn't you all heard the late sad report of poor Mr. Horner? Aye. Aye, 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 aye. aye. Why, thou jealous fool, dost thou doubt it? He's an arrant French capon. Tis false, sir. You shall not disparage poor Mr. Horner, for to my knowledge... Oh, hold! Stop her mouth! Upon my honour, sir, tis as true! Do you think we would have been seen in his company? 
trust our unspotted reputations with him. This you get, and, and we too, by trusting your secret to a fool. Oh, the peace, madam. Ah, oh, well, doctor, is not this a good design that carries a man on unsus unsuspected and brings him off safe? Well, if this were true, but my wife... Dorland whispers with Mrs. Pinchwife. Come, brother, your wife is yet innocent, you see, but have a care of too strong an imagination, lest, like an over-concerned timorous gamester, by fancying an unlucky cast, it should come. Women and fortune are truest still to those that trust them. And any wild thing grows, but the more fierce and hungry for being kept up, and more dangerous to the keeper. There's doctrine for all husbands, Mr. Harcourt. I edify, madam. So much that I am impatient till I am one. And I edify so much by example, I will never be one. And because I will not disparage my parts, I will never be one. <laughs> and I, alas, can't be one. But I must be one against my will to a country wife with a country moraine to me. And I must be a country wife still too, I find, for I can't, like a city one, be rid of my musty husband and do what I list. Now, sir, I must pronounce your wife innocent, though I blush whilst I do it, and I am the only man by her now exposed to shame, which I will straight drown in wine, as you shall your suspicion, and the lady's troubles will divert with a ballad. Uh, doctor, where are your maskers? Indeed, she's innocent, sir. I am her witness, and her end of coming out was but to see her sister's wedding, and what she has said to your face of her love to Mr. Horner was but the usual innocent revenge on a husband's jealousy. Was it not, madam? Speak. Since you'll have me tell more lies. Yes, indeed, but... For my own sake, Thane, I would all believe. Cuckolds like lovers should themselves deceive. But... Uh, his honour is least safe, too late, I find, who trusts it with a foolish wife or friend. Ah, uh, vain fox, but caught in dress and keep up hover to pass for women's men with one another. Ah, uh, but he who aims by women to be prized, first by the men, you see, he must be despised. Exit. Oh. Now you, the vigorous who daily hear, oh, a vizard mask in public domineer, and what you do to her, if in place where, nay, have the confidence to cry, come out. Yet when she says, lead on, you are not stout. For to your well-dressed brother, straight turn round, and cry pox on her, Ned, she can't be sound. Then slink away, a fresh one to engage, with so much seeming heat and loving rage, you'll frighten, listening, actress on the stage. Till she at last has seen you huffing come, and talk of keeping in the tiring room, yet cannot be provoked to lead her home. Next. You full staffs of fifty who beset your buckra maiden heads, which you friends get. And whilst to them you of achievement boast, they share the booty and laugh at your cost. In fine, you essenced boys, both old and young, who were be thought so eager, brisk and strong. Yet do the ladies not their husbands wrong, whose purses for your manhood make excuse and keep your Flanders mares for show, not use. Encouraged by our women's man today, a horner's part may vainly think to play, and may intrigue so bashfully disown they may, they, that they may doubt it be by few or none, may kiss the cards of piquet, ombre, lou, and so be taught to kiss the lady too. But gallants, have a care, faith what you do, the world which to no man his due will give, you by experience. No, you can deceive, and men may still believe you vigorous. But then we women, there's no cousin in us. End of play.